These are the Navier-Stokes equations as they're commonly written. In this screencast, we examine their physical meaning and perform a simple mathematical derivation based on Newton's second law. While these equations may look intimidating and complicated to a lot of people, all they really are is a statement that the sum of forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. To make it a little bit more apparent, let's flip the equations about the equal sign. So what we have in the first equation is the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And the second and third equations are the sum of forces in the y and the z direction equal to their respective accelerations. These equations are written for a differential element of fluid which is infinitesimally small, so as small as we can possibly imagine. The three forces we're concerned with are the forces due to gravity, forces due to differences in pressure, and forces due to the viscosity of the fluid. Keep in mind that each of these terms is on a per unit volume basis. So typically we would say the force due to gravity might be the weight of something. If I took the weight and divided by the volume, what I'm left with is the density m over v times gravity. We see this occurring for gravity most explicitly. On the right hand side of the equation, if we have mass times acceleration, if we were to divide that by the volume of the fluid, we would be left with the density times the acceleration. So we're looking at the sum of forces is equal to ma on a per unit volume basis. For this screencast, let's deal only with the x direction. The same mathematics would apply for the y and the z directions, but we'll leave it with the x direction to save time. Let's examine the right hand side of the x component. The x component of velocity for a fluid we'll call lowercase u, and strictly speaking u could be a function of x, y, z, and time. The x component of acceleration for the fluid is equal to the time derivative of u is a derivative of u with respect to time. But because u is not simply a function of time, it's also a function of x, y, and z, we need to use the chain rule to perform this differentiation. So I've got the partial u with respect to time plus du dx times dx dt plus du dy dy dt plus du dz times dz dt. If I use the definition that dx dt is simply equal to u, dy dt is equal to lowercase v, and dz dt is equal to lowercase w, we're left with something that looks an awful lot like the right-hand side of the equation above. The first term on the right-hand side is known as a local acceleration, and the remaining three terms are known as the convective acceleration. To think about what this means physically, let's consider some fluid that's flowing steadily from left to right through this two-dimensional constriction. And let's consider a differential element of fluid, which will be uh, infinitesimally small. So I'll make it a real small cube, and let's place it right here to begin with. If you think about the motion of this element of fluid as it flows through, it's flowing steadily from left to right. It's slow in this region, but then it begins to accelerate because of the constriction, where the fluid is moving very rapidly here. And now when it reaches the right-hand side, it slows down again and it recovers to a steady velocity as it moves towards the exit. If the flow of fluid is at steady state, then the velocity of the differential element of fluid at points 1, 2, and 3, we would see no change over time. But let's examine the constricting region. We've got u is a positive quantity. It's moving from left to right. And du dx is also a positive quantity. So this term of the convective acceleration is greater than 0. So we see in the highlighted region that the fluid element is accelerating from left to right. Conversely, in the expanding region, although u is positive, du dx is less than zero. It's a negative quantity. The fluid is slowing down within that region. So the convective acceleration term is less than zero, or it would be the acceleration would be to the left in the highlighted region. Let's examine the forces acting on the differential element of fluid a little bit more carefully. We'll call this point x, y, z. In our differential element of fluid has lengths dx, a height dy, and a depth dz. The first force we'll consider is gravity, and typically when you draw a free body diagram, gravity will be acting downward in the y direction. But let's do an arbitrary case where a component of gravity, could, for example, could act in the x direction. So the force due to gravity is the mass of our differential element of fluid times the x component of gravity. 
Let's rewrite the mass is equal to the density times the volume of our differential element of fluid, dx, dy, dz. So again, have the mass times gravity in the x direction. Let's examine forces acting on the left and the right sides of our differential element. We could have a normal stress acting directly to the right on the right face and a, a stress acting to the left, outward uh, from the left face. The notation we'll use for these stresses is sigma xx, and we're going to evaluate sigma xx at x plus a distance dx. And on the left face, we have sigma xx evaluated at x. On the top and the bottom faces, we could have a shear stress acting to the right on the top face and a shear stress acting to the left on, a, on the bottom face. The notation we'll use for these stresses is tau yx evaluated at y plus dy for the top of the cube and tau yx evaluated at y for the bottom of the cube. And additionally, we could have stresses acting to the right on the fronts of the cube and a stress acting to the left at the back of the cube. For the back of the cube, we'll use the notation tau zx evaluated at z. And at the front of the cube, we'll use the notation tau zx evaluated at z plus dz. To continue writing the sum of forces in the x direction, I've got any x component of gravity plus a normal stress, sigma xx, evaluated at x plus dx, multiplied by the surface area of the right side of the cube, which is equal to dy dz. Because it acts to the left, I'll subtract sigma xx, evaluated at x, multiplied by the same area, dy dz. Then I'll add the force due to the shear stress at the top of the cube, tau yx evaluated at y plus dy, multiplied by its area, which is dx times dz. I'll subtract the shear stress acting on the bottom face, multiplied by its area. Then I'll add the force due to the shear stress at the front of the face and subtract off the shear stress acting at the rear face. The sum of these forces will equal the mass times the acceleration in the x direction, or I could write mass is equal to rho times dx dy dz times the acceleration in the x direction. Here I've cleaned up that equation divided by the volume of the differential element, and what I immediately see is that dx dy dz's will cancel out, and in some terms if I simplify it, dy and dz will cancel out, dx cancels out as well as dz in this term and so forth as I ca cancel out terms. As I continue to simplify I'm left with, an, with this expression and in the limit of dx, dy, and dz are, are approaching zero uh, this turns into a differential form. And the resulting equation represents the sum of forces in the x direction due to gravity due to the normal forces acting on the left and the right side of the differential element, the shear stresses acting on the top and the bottom of the element, and the shear stresses acting in the front and the rear faces of the element. So these are equal to the density times the acceleration of the differential element in the x direction. And if I expand the acceleration into its local and convective components, we're left with the, an expression on the right hand side. If I did the same analysis for the y and the z directions, I would come up with these three equations, which are known as the equations of motion for a fluid. But to get from these equations to the Navier-Stokes equations, we need a, a way to relate the normal and the shear stresses to the viscosity of the fluid and the velocity profiles. And this is done using these equations, which are the constitutive relations for a Newtonian fluid, which we won't get into here. But if we accept them as being true for this screencast, it becomes a series of algebraic manipulations to arrive at the Navier-Stokes equation. The first substitution into the left-hand side gives me the expression at the bottom. If I differentiate the three terms, I'm left with this expression. And some additional manipulations leaves me with this expression, in which I've split this term into two parts. And I've switched the order in which I differentiate these two terms. So I'm switching dy dx and, dd, and this expression. 
So I continue to simplify and rearrange terms, I'm left with this expression. But what's interesting is the sum of these three terms, du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz, is equal to zero by way of the continuity equation. So that whole term on the right is identically zero for an incompressible fluid. So what I'm left with is the sum of three forces, the force due to gravity, force due to any pressure differences in the fluid, plus all the forces due to viscosity. The sum of these three is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the x component of its acceleration. And expanding ax out into its local and convective components of acceleration, I've just arrived at the first, the x component for the Navier-Stokes equation. So we could do the exact same thing for the y and the z directions, and we'll arrive at the Navier-Stokes equations for those directions as well. If I flip the order of the equations, you're left with the Navier-Stokes equations as you'll commonly see them. And although they may look intimidating and complicated to begin with, if someone asks you to sum up what the Navier-Stokes equations are in words, just simply tell them they're an expression of the sum of forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration.